You shot to Well, there were there were uh, times that uh let's it, let's start over. Okay. Because you said we, we shot two birds. I want to make sure we get it all. I end it because it's gems. They're gems. They're you gems. Know? <laughs> it's all gems. It is. So you were saying that you shot two separate Well, at the time we made that, uh they were worried about the rating, obviously. Um it was breaking a lot of new ground. Um and it's interesting because if you look at it now, it looks fairly tame compared but it was pretty intense then. So I think Paramount um, was concerned about either the rating or selling it to television or whatever. So there were times when the language got real salty that we would shoot another version. Same, same exact thing, but just replace a word. Right. So, so you did shoot two. In certain scenes, you know. Funniest one, though, I remember I was tuning in to see it on TV. And there's that famous scene with you and John Travolta in the car just after the a love scene. Mm-hmm. And he turns Nicely around put. You and he goes, he says, he says, now you're nasty. And I said, well, that's just not what he said in the movie theater. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It could have been, uh, you know, the, the separate version. Sometimes it sounded worse, actually. Um, I remember there was... Uh, there was a scene where, let me see how I can phrase this. He said to her, uh, do you want to be a nice girl or do you want to be a blank? And in the other version, he said, do you want to be a nice girl or do you want to be a pig? And I thought, that's just as bad. But, you know, it was an acceptable word. So they went, <laughs> a pig is always good. You know, I mean, I suppose if you have to be called something that was uh, not perfect, that would be it, I guess. Eric, can we just tilt up just a little bit? We do. Stay, yeah. Just a tiny bit. Just a bit right there. I'm really, really God bless you. you. I'm glad. Um, let's let's sort of backtrack a little bit. How did you get involved with Saturday Night Fever? And I know everybody auditions, but what was your? Um, that was that's actually an amazing uh, little side story. I um, I had just gotten out of school maybe a year prior to that. I'd gone to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. And I had done off-Broadway and some smaller roles in touring companies. And uh, I was not at the point in my career where I got a lot of information prior to going in on any really audition. And for this one, um, I assumed it was yet another small little two-line, three-line character, if I was lucky. Um, And... John Avildsen was set to direct it originally, and I had three auditions with John Avildsen, but it was all improvisational and uh, very little script work, Um, more interested in the character and kind of your interpretation. And then he went away, and the film project kind of went on hold for a while, and I didn't think much of it, thinking it was a nothing role anyway. Um... And then when John Batham was brought on, I had, I think, two or three auditions with him as well. Uh, again, thinking it was, I thought, why are they bothering to see me so much for this little tiny role? And my agent never told me because she figured I would pretty much flip out and blow it. So she just thought it was a little role. And uh, I found out, I think, on a Thursday or Friday, and I started rehearsal that Monday. Mm. And got the script over the weekend and, and pretty much had a heart attack. Or heart. Yeah, why am I in this so much? I mean, <laughs> um, how much for the shooting started? John Badham is such a smart director. He had us rehearse for probably two weeks, at least, I think, if I remember. Um, and we shot that movie backwards. So the dancing was the last part of it to be shot. And we were in rehearsal uh, with a wonderful choreographer named Lester Wilson. So I think it was a three-month shoot, and we pretty much, right up until the wire, were rehearsing some aspect of the film. Oh. Yeah. Um, tell me about the first days or nights of shooting. My first, well, I had never done a movie. Um, I was so panic-stricken that... Uh, there would be uh, uh, cameras, and I had no experience in any of this. So I just thought, you know, please, God, let me 
let me not walk off the set accidentally if I have no stage to sort of figure out where I am. Um, and I remember the first night uh, of shooting, I, um, I went to the location and I had a little, I don't know why, but I had like a little bag of stuff with me thinking I might need it, makeup or hair things. I had never done anything where I was really a focused, uh, um, a leading character. So I had all these things with me thinking nobody would be there to do makeup or hair. So I stood at the corner like a kid waiting for someone to basically figure out I was there for a reason. And finally, I saw someone with a clipboard and said, I think I'm supposed to go somewhere and pretty of what's called a call sheet. So someone took me away like a stranded child. And what was the worst first location? Uh, the dance studio. Really? It was the outside of the dance studio when he tells her he's not going to dance with her for the contest. And there's a scene where... Um, I think I run in with uh, condoms. Um, I don't know if you can use that. Uh, all the things outside the dance studio we did the first night, which was pretty intense for me because I had to deal with being um, doing something out of sync. You know, the, the character had already gone through a series of events. And was I'm figuring yeah. that out. But yeah. Tough. That's where you count on your acting lessons. Right? <laughs> What was Travolta like in those early shoot days? He was, and is, I think, you know, pretty much the most giving person. He he so cares about not just his work, the overall uh, scene and um, making sure everybody else is happy with their performance. And he was so not playing the star. And most of us in that film had never done any film work prior. And if we had done any work at all, it was stage and fairly, you know, unimportant roles. Uh, and he wanted everyone to feel like it was all about them. And I remember just being so grateful and comfortable with him. Right. What was it like on location with John Truffaut, with Eddie Barbarino oh, at that time? It was a zoo. I remember sitting in the makeup trailer. They'd have these big Winnebago trailers. And, uh, all of a sudden, it started to rock, and there were so many fans watching um, the shooting that, and they were unhappy that he wasn't out there yet, that they literally started to shake the trailer, um, which was pretty weird, but at the same time, kind of, you know, exciting. I thought, oh, God, we're going to die. This is so cool. I said, I'm in a film that's this hot and it's not even released. And you thought, you know, it's probably, you thought well, I've never done this before, so that's supposed to be your mind. Uh, this, this is obviously something I should be prepared for. <laughs> you like, all films are going to be just like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to start with a film that, that big. It's hard to get your makeup done when the, when the trailer's rocking. That's very true. Um, it must be challenging for the makeup artist. You know, now that you mention it, it probably was a fun more it did. <laughs> Um, Joe talked today about the scenes at the Brooklyn Bridge. The, Ver the, Brooklyn, the Verizon, Verizon, Verizon yeah. Bridge. Um, I, could you sort of walk me through that and start with how you got there? <laughs> um, sure. It, the, 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 it was so cold. I remember it was unusually cold for the time of year we did it. And uh, everyone was freezing. And um, it's very time consuming because they had rigging to do, obviously, so nobody, they had a stuntman doing the fall and all that. Uh, but I think we were there, I'm all over the place, let me try it. Um, we were there for probably a week. And I could be wrong, it could have been longer. Huh. Um, because it's all obviously done in sections. And I remember uh, as the days went on, the emotional, aspect of it got more intense, especially for my character. Uh, and I, I just thought, if this is what making movies is, is going to be like, I don't know if I've got much more in me after this, because it was really uh, mentally uh, challenging to, to, to try and keep yourself on that emotional level so you give the performance you want um, at the same time not wanting to go there, you know, personally. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, 
it was, it was, it was scary. That whole week was pretty scary. And yet, um, I think it, you know, obviously pays off in the film. Totally. <laughs> well, your, your emotions, both in the first scene on the bridge and the second scene on the bridge, it was first. Huge. I mean, they're just big, old, scared out of your wits emotions. John Badham, I remember when we did the scene where they uh, they make believe they all jump off the bridge, and uh, Annette runs out of the car. She says, "Oh!" And when I was doing it, he had the camera lens here, and he'd say, "Okay, now there's John's character, and there's so and so's character, and there's Joe, and there's Barry." And I, I remember looking all over the, basically the uh, the barn doors or the the lens area uh, to to figure out where everybody was and emotionally what was happening. And so they were talking me through it at the same time. Now he's just gone over, and he's just gone over. And the third time he goes over, get out of the car. And so it was kind of like twister. <laughs> um, but everybody was so in the moment. And everyone was so supportive that it was not as abstract. Right. You know, people really cared about this project. Yeah. So um, as many takes as it took, it was okay. I heard your reaction to them was not scripted. When you saw them sort of standing there in the... Um, I, when I looked, realized that they were standing there. Um, it, the it, it may not have been. I honestly don't remember. Do you remember what your reaction was? Yeah. Uh, so I guess I, I must have been really ticked off. <laughs> People improvisation. Yeah, well, we did, a, we did so much improvisation in that film that um, I bet if I went, you know, through the script, I would probably be surprised. But we were all so into these characters and we were all so... Absolutely uh, married to the idea that this was going to be the best performance anybody ever gave on on all fronts. Everyone was was really committed. Um, so it was really fun as an actor to get to go full out, uh, even more full out than one would expect. Tell me who your character was. Tell me, just Craig. Well, her name was Annette uh, in the in the. Um, in the script, she didn't have a last name, but in my uh, in my head, her last name was, I think I had Scalisi. It was somebody's name I had heard, and I thought, I like that name. And uh, I made her a very definite composite of a few girls I had seen at the club prior to filming. I went in there, and um, going to a disco was as foreign to me as anything you could imagine. And I was uh, frightened that I didn't know this world well enough to... Um, really give a a a full on sketch of somebody, and it, or a full on performance generally. And and I went there with a couple of the. I think Joe went and Paul went. Um, and I was so blown away that these people were so totally territorial. This was their club. This was their scene, and uh, it was so much like the article this was taken from was a New York Magazine article called um, a Tribal Rights of a Saturday Night. And there was this gang called The Faces, but they were more of a dance gang than a violent gang. Um, and we, we saw these people, and I was astounded of the, that reality, and I thought this is better than, than anything I could ever do for this character is to really look at these people and decide who she is, what she is. And for all of what was in the script, I kept seeing these girls who were so lost and they were so sad that they hadn't been picked. Or it was a different kind of wallflower. It wasn't like a school dance. It was more of, am I in this um, society or not? And uh, that's who she is. You know, she's she's constantly trying to get the approval and the acceptance. And she's so crazy for this guy who obviously um, can have anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's driven just like these girls were. And, and I think uh, she she turned out being one of those people that everyone knew someone like her. Yeah. I think. 
tip that you gave for that, though. Well, thank you. She was, she, I mean, I, I must say, uh, you know, you, you, you hope for roles like that in your career, and you're thrilled when you get a few. And, uh, I mean, I'm, to this day, very grateful that I had that shot. Yeah. She had an amazing character, though. Yeah. She sort of, then they gave her a lot of, you gave her, and like, the script, you know, it's interesting, because the script was, yeah. As much as portions of the script were over the top, there was also kind of a minimalism to it. You know, these characters were really defined less by what they said and more about how they behaved, how they reacted. Well, I think, as in life, life is really more about reaction than action. And, and it's how people treat the information or treat the situation that really defines them. And I think that was part of what... uh John Batum wanted to bring to these characters, and he let us really run with them. And he said, the, the most important thing is to believe this is really happening and for the people in the audience to really feel that they're watching something as it happens. And, um, you know, if you tell an actor to go with that and they like to do what, you know, acting is about, it, it's like, you know, a racehorse. Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's easy to look in retrospect and say, ooh, these iconic moments, you know, John Travolta dancing in his white suit on the flashing lights of the 2001 disco. But when you're there and you're hearing nothing but a click track <laughs> and watching him, do, do you see the, the future, you know, iconography of that? Or are you seeing just great dance? What are you seeing when, when you're watching, when you're dancing on that, in that a, situation? It's a great question. Um, I don't think you have a clue. I didn't. I had absolutely no idea this was going to be as huge as it was. Um, the floor that was in that uh, club, I think, was the only thing they brought in. Most everything else was already there. They brought the floor in. And I remember thinking, how do you dance on this Just sort of uh, assault of color? Um and they also had a lot of smoke effects. And it was slippery because the floor was plastic of some sort. Uh, and the smoke made it damp. So we were at one point looking very much like the ice capades. Um, sort of disco ice capades. It was Projected a, ice capades. Yes, it was pretty scary. And so they'd have to mop up the floor and do it again. When John was dancing uh, his solo, I remember... It was so incredibly warm in there, and they had the smoke effect going. And I think he actually was having to take a little oxygen at times because it was so hot and so difficult to do it over and over and over. And it must have been, if not 95 degrees higher. Uh, and you're trying to look cool, and you're trying to look very spontaneous. And he's just one of those people that is a perfectionist without being a complainer. So he would just do it over and over. And I remember watching him thinking, I don't know where this man gets that stamina. And I think his attitude really set the tone for everyone else. Because if he's going to do it and not moan about it, no one else should. Even more impressive in the middle of the... In the middle of the shooting, obviously, Dan Highland passed away. But so yeah. do you, what do you remember about that period? Um, you know, John and I became good friends, and we talked a lot about uh, relationships and things that you do when you're in your early 20s and everything is so incredibly full on and what have you. But he so loved her. And I thought, wow, you know, this is like a different kind of relationship. It was really serious, and he was very committed to her and very much in love with her. And when she died, he went back to Los Angeles for um, a couple of weeks, and they stopped production. And you could tell part of him was gone when he came back emotionally. He was so churned up about it. But he, he still you know, gave over to the film and gave everything he wanted, I think, for that character. But I think his emotions were so on edge and so close 
to the surface that his performance was even more extraordinary before, because of it, rather. Uh, because how do you not deal with the fact that you've just lost somebody you love that much? And um, there are times I'll look at that film and I'll, I'll see him, I think, thinking of Diana, you know, and, and it's just a little moment. Is there uh, a moment you can think of? There's a moment on the, in, the, in the film where he's talking to Karen Gorney. And they're sitting talking about the bridge. And he's describing the size of the bridge and all of the goings on with the building of the bridge. And there's a moment at the very end of that scene where he just looks off and a tear starts to come in his eye. And I think yes. part of that is just how emotional he was along with the performance. I, I mean, I, I certainly know this was what he intended to do, but... I think he was so vulnerable at the time that he allowed feelings to come out that were extraordinary. And I remember seeing that and just being so moved. And even now, I think it's still a very moving moment. Yeah. What was, it's that moment when she sees him for the first time, isn't it? When her character sees him for the first time as something other than Absolutely. this sort of posturing Brooklynite. I think she accepts the fact also at that point or the... I, it's kind of how I visualize that scene there. She she comes to terms with who she is to some extent as well. That it's not... She'll ever come to terms with who she is. Well, there was a moment there I think she thought, well, maybe it's not so bad where I came from. And maybe people aren't so terrible. <laughs> and uh, because I think there's a little respect there that she has for him in that scene that I'd like to think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a great book. I'm watching it again. I thought, you know, as it opened, you have those scenes of him walking down the the, the strut, doing the the strut. You know, the iconic everything. It's just from the opening of that movie is iconic. The minute you hear that music by the Bee Gees, you got to think of John doing his strut down the down the road. There's a there's a moment where I don't think I've ever told this. Um, it's so incredibly unimportant. Um, but there's a moment where he's walking down the street and I remember watching that scene and, and John Badham said, just cross camera it for me for a second. And there's a big blur for just a, a portion of a second, which is me. Um, and you'd have to see the film and actually find that blur, but it's just when he's walking and then somebody just crosses camera. Uh, and I thought, how cool to, to know that I'm in that little moment of the, because it, it, it's a historical moment. It really is. But he's just amazing. That, what was it like watching that being shot? Was it? it was so much fun because we didn't have the click track. We didn't have a track. He just had that in his head. So it was just this fun attitude that he had. Um, I'd never heard most of the music until I saw the film. Really? Uh, obviously, I, I heard what I danced to. And I heard some of... Uh, the songs if they were sent over to production. Some of them were on the radio, though, by the time they were filmed to me, yes. Yeah. But I had never, I, I heard the song that uh, Karen and John danced to and that I danced to, and obviously Night Fever that we all did the hustle to, but I had never heard a lot of the other music. Um, if it didn't involve my character, I either wasn't there or it wasn't laid down yet on the film. So Amazing. Yeah. What was it like at the premiere? Wait, which one? Did you go to both of them? Did you go to the one in New York? No, I just or? went to the one in New York. Um, it's amazing. My grandfather uh, went with me as my date. And um, I think my whole family went, in fact. I, I We looked like clowns getting out of a Volkswagen at the circus. We were like so many people in a limo. Um, said, here's so-and-so and here's so-and-so. <laughs> um, but my grandfather uh, was a movie projectionist. And I used to spend Saturdays, he, he worked at a theater called the RKO Albeek, which was one of those big, grandiose theaters in, in New York. And I used to go with him on Saturdays and watch movies from the little window. So, and he was very uh, much a part of my life. And, and I thought, well, what, what more could I put a perfect date? But I was scared that he was going to see, obviously some of the things. And he was very wise. He said, I've been showing movies for 50 years. Do you think I'm going to think they're real now? You know, which I thought, well, I'm worried for nothing. He's a lot hipper than I am. 
So, uh, but that night was was pretty surreal. There was a lot of a lot of screaming, a lot of fans. First time I'd ever seen paparazzi. I had no clue what that was, and um, I think I was shocked <laughs> most of the time that night, or were in some kind of uh, altered state. You know, when you watch yourself versus actually be in the moment. Um, and I can actually fix a a piece of uh, a rumor that's been going on since the film that uh, I had lost 15 pounds when before the movie came out, and I was really imp- just so proud of myself. I had little honey dress ups, and uh, someone said, "You look thinner than you did," and I said, "Yes, I've lost 15 pounds," and it got turned around that I gained 50 pounds. For the movie. Yes, this is somehow a rumor that goes on. That's never been true. I want to fix that now. Okay. Okay, so yeah. that's never been true. Um, but it was an exciting night. It was oh a very... God, that's yeah. amazing. It was a very exciting night. And what did your grandfather say? Sorry, was he... I mean, still and all, as walking in and he has a professional, but still and all, he's watching his little granddaughter up on that screen doing things that, you know, you weren't... It wasn't a Disney film. No, no. Um, Mm-hmm. He was really cool about it. Um, and my whole family was pretty cool about it, I have to say. I think if they were mortified, they kept it to themselves. And they were more excited about the break I had gotten and the success that it brought me because it put me on the map. Totally. Um, and the film was really such a, uh, a comment of that era that it became part of society in, in the sense that that's how they view, they call it the disco age or whatever. Well, it was such yeah. an accurate snapshot, you know, at that time. Like, yeah. I remember it being a little movie. When I first saw it, I first saw it, and it was this tiny little slice of light movie, which they were making a lot of at that time. Mm-hmm. You know, two or three million dollars, I think Joe said. A million and a half. A million and a half. Can you imagine? A million and a half. Did you get any residuals? Oh, no, but I'd have paid them. <laughs> oh, I made scale and it was more money than I ever saw in my life. Mm. Um, I, I, I have nothing but gratitude as far as that is concerned. It's just to make that kind of launch to a career was extraordinary. I always kid around saying, you know, I'm a Jewish girl from Brooklyn who's made a career out of being Italian. <laughs> um, but it got me the best tables in Little Italy. Right. So, <laughs> there you go. Okay, so oh, are we rolling? We are. We're rolling. Excellent. Best tables I've ever had. Good to know. Um, good Italian restaurants in Fort Lee. Not as many as there used to be, but they're. Yeah. Well, you're going to have to show me these places yeah, so I can. You know. You're the first to be the first Italian. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about what happened to you then. We, we've sort of much covered Saturday Night Fever, unless there's something that you're dying to tell that you've never told anybody ever. Oh. Uh, as a joke, they were going to park that car in front of my parents' house at one point. Uh, they thought it would be funny. Who? Um, I don't know. Some of the crew thought it'd be fun. Said, Let's put a big bow on it and give it to us. I said, you know, if I never see that car again, I'll be okay. That's that's the one little party favor I can do without. <laughs> oh, yeah. Tough to shoot the uh, the uh, the falling off the bridge scene through the actual fur? Um, it was. It was. It was all... Somehow you felt emotionally connected to what the storyline was. Um, and you did feel like you were sort of going through it. And the funny story is uh, that um, now this was my first movie. And in the DVD, uh, John compliments me beautifully. John Batman says uh, she was always very emotional and, and she would just keep take after take after take. And... And I said, when I saw him uh, after that, I said, that was so sweet of you. Thank you so much. Um, And then later on, I said to my husband, you know, it was my first job. And I thought I'd get fired if I didn't keep doing the same thing over and over. Um, I love that I'm such a great actress and, and I'll take that. But the bottom line really was that I thought I was supposed to keep giving even if I was off camera. So... Um, I would go home and basically be totally disbanded, but I would always give it my all because I didn't want to lose the chance. 
<laughs> you realize that once they had shot a bunch of scenes with you, they weren't about to let you go. I hoped. <laughs> so Joe, Joe also talked about the um, the uh, DVD release party. Hey. He said that was huge. Were you were there. I was, and it was amazing. And I thought, for for all of the times you have a camera and never use it, for me not to have a camera, the entire cast was there. And I was so blown away that everybody showed up. But it was great fun. It was uh, really, it was, I think, Urban Cowboy and Saturday Night Fever in Greece. And all of the, um, basically was all the films John had done at that point for Paramount. And everyone came. It was unbelievable. It was like uh, a high school reunion. Uh, it was just amazing, you know. And I kept thinking, uh, do I look younger than them or do they look younger than me or did they gain more weight than I did or did, but for the most part, everybody was happy to see just so great. Yeah. Yeah, here that the producers a performance. State did uh, John and Olivia. And I think a lot of the cast did either summer, mm. summer loving. Um, and then Olivia and John sang, uh, yeah, the one that I want. yeah which was, say, say it, consider me here, you're the one that I want. They sing. It was, which was amazing because they had the exact energy that they had for the film and, and, and they're really good friends. So they must've had a great time doing it. So, but everyone, um, really wanted to be there and really wanted to be a part of that anniversary. It was nice. Wow. Yeah. The one, the one from did that. Plus tree party. I mean, come on. That's right. You know, it's such a gift. This whole thing is, you know, people that get jaded and kind of say, oh, yeah, you know, I've been there, done that. You know, it's crazy. It, this is the best job in the world. I mean, how, how could you not be not only thrilled and grateful, but, uh, you know, just say, yeah, I'll be there. I'd like to be a part of that. So what happened to you when the Saturday Night Seeper, so the, right, so the Saturday Night Seeper sort of uh, came out and all of a sudden now you've gone from being this unknown to something that everybody must recognize. It was so surreal. I, I know I keep using that word, but I remember walking down, uh, I think it was Broadway or one of the streets in Manhattan that had a little monitor. Uh, uh, it had a movie theater where they were playing Saturday Night Fever and had a little monitor set up in front so people walking by could see coming attractions, um, previews of some sort. Uh, and I remember walking over and, and seeing the big Saturday Night Fever sign I thought, oh, you know, because you don't think anybody's looking at you when you walk down the street. And, and I stopped and I, I was watching some of the footage and I was really digging it. And all of a sudden, this crowd started to assemble. And, and I was so watching, thinking, oh, this is it. And they're doing that. And I thought, what? What? I had no clue. I had, and it terrified me because I didn't know how to respond or. Well, you're at this girl in here. And I said, well, yeah, I am. And, and, and then suddenly there were more and more and more. And I, it was the first time I had thought about anonymity or, or, or just being in the hub of something that popular. Uh, and I kind of said, well, I have to go now. And I grabbed a cab and I got out of there. And I was simultaneously thrilled and scared out of my wits, you know. Um, but then it, it started to really snowball and I started to get offers for other work and I liked that a lot. That was good. Um, and I had meetings set up in Los Angeles vis-a-vis -vis the agents and what have you. And I suddenly found myself, you know, sitting at lunch with incredibly important people and famous people, desperately trying not to spill something on myself. Still that early insecurity that oh, quite goes away. I remember having um, lunch with Neil Simon and Herb Ross, which, hello, uh, just even saying their names, you know, scares me. So, and eat. No, well, and I remember I had on a scarf, of, and I remember at the end of the um, the lunch, I, uh, I was incredibly careful. And at the end of lunch, I wiped my face with my scarf. Which I thought was, you know, so me. <laughs> and I think Neil had said something like, you know, you're wiping your face with your scarf. I said, yes, I do that all the time. Quirky me. 
But uh, yeah, it was fun. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing to have lots of meetings with various people. What was, what was, what was the next big thing for you after Saturday Night Fever? Angie. Was that the next very, really big thing? Uh, yeah, I was, Oosh. there were a couple of uh, TV movies in between and there was a feature that I was supposed to do that went into what's called turnaround and it got lot by another studio and there was a lot of waiting around for projects that I was attached to that didn't get made and uh, I had uh, gotten a call from the agent saying okay. Gary Marshall wants to see you. So great, I'll wipe my face with my scarf again. Um, but he would probably help you with. He'd probably use your scarf to wipe. He would write something great about right that it's a story about a scarf and a girl. Um, for quick, and I thought great. And he pitched the show Angie to me, um, which was really amazing to have Gary Marshall pitch a show to you. It's like watching a show, having him pitch a show. And I remember him saying, uh, oh, she's a girl at a place and, you know, she, uh, she, is, she doesn't know how to deal with rich people when she asks somebody and they say, well, when you throw a big party, you give them a party favor and she forgets. So at the end, she gives everybody $5 and she says, here, go buy yourself something. Hearing Gary Marshall tell you that, you know, he's it, so funny. And I thought, this is great. I'd love to do this show. And and I couldn't at the time because I was signed to something that ultimately didn't get made. So I said, uh, you know, I'd love to, but I don't think I can. And he said, what? I said, I, I don't know if I can. What is the... We'll see. And um, he said, OK. And he called ABC. He said, she doesn't want to do it. I don't think, you know, which is pretty weird considering, you know, the state of television now and uh, <laughs> people saying, please, let me let me just work. I'll go over there and give you a bagel. Um, but at the time, I was on s so many various flights to do other uh, projects that uh, uh, the powers around me kept saying, you know, well, we'll wait on the TV. And then finally, I said, you know what? I really want to do this. I, I let everything else fall and I don't want to just keep waiting. I, I am so blown away by this man and his talent and this idea of this show. So we went back to it and the rest is uh, Angie. You know, you make it sound so easy. It's like one sentence and then, and then I did this. And then I did this. It wasn't that easy, was it? But, At the time, it because I had just come off of this movie, um, it, it wasn't that it was that easy. It was that I was very much sought after. Right. Um, and it's harder, I think, when you start to have that go first. And then when the lull comes, okay, right. you have no idea what that is. I kept thinking, well, shouldn't I be having lunch with someone important and wiping my face with my scarf? And they said, well, no, no one's invited you. I said, oh, how do I do that? You know, sit, <laughs> sit. You know, it's a funny kind of cyclical thing, this industry, and you got to roll with it, but it's hard when you're 22 and so they go, here, have the world. Hey, by the way, this is, this is put for you and here's the world. Being, being given to you by the king of the world. Exactly. Yeah. How do you do? I'm the president of show business and hey. I own more. There you go. There you go. Uh, so, so now you're, now you're in work world and, and, and at Fonzie world and Laverne and Shirley world and the world of all the Gary Marshall characters that, 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 that. in his heyday, might I say. Oh, Paramount was sitcom college. There was, uh, Mork and Mindy in one soundstage and then Angie and then Taxi, Laverne and Shirley, uh, Happy Days. I think at one point, um... Tom Hanks and Peter Sklari were doing Bosom but So when you go to the commissary at lunchtime, it was like being in the middle of the Hollywood Reporter, but everyone was so young and it all seemed so normal that it was like high school. I think Robin Williams had a great line that show business was high school with money. And, <laughs> and that's kind of what it was like then. Everybody was over. Um, and uh, in fact... It, when we were shooting Angie, Robin used to like to run over in the middle of a taping and just go nuts. And and who could keep a straight face? I mean, he he could just, you know, perform for days on end and you would just be on the floor laughing. That's hilarious. Yeah. What happens behind the scenes? So you also had, uh, oh, I don't know, one or two really good co-stars on that show. 
Quite a few. Uh, Doris Roberts, who played my mom. Way pre... Way pre... Uh, pre Raymond. Um, and Robert Hayes. Uh, Deborah Lee Scott, who unfortunately passed on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very, very young, uh, talent girl. Um, and uh, Sharon Spellman. It was, it was a Emery Bass. My gosh, it was an incredible cast. But a lot of us have stayed very close, which has, has been very nice. Doris and I are still friends. And, uh, Bob is God's father to my son, and I'm godmother to his son. And I was saying, that's like one big happy family. So it was, was that uh, pre airplane for Robert Gates? Airplane was shot mm-hmm. during the second season of Angie. Um, I actually went to uh, watch them film the Saturday Night Fever takeoff. And I literally thought my head was going to explode because I couldn't, I, I couldn't laugh out loud. And it was so hysterical. And Bob wouldn't tell me what it was. He just said, I want you to come and watch this particular scene being shot. It's hysterical. Okay, it's great. Ah, boy, that's a great story. Yeah, so I was, um, I was standing behind something. To- <laughs> were they playing the the music, or are they just so so sort of? It was the playback of. Uh, when did you realize what was going to sort of bring me, without sort of giving away the punchline? Okay, sort of tell me the story of how he invited you and brought you over because that's okay. Great. Um, Robert Hayes was doing airplanes simultaneously with our second season of Angie, and some days uh, he would film. Some of that and then come to rehearsal. And one day he said, you know, we're filming a sunny scene tomorrow. Uh, I think, you you know, you could probably come by for a little bit and take a look at it. And I said, sure. Um, and and he uh, wouldn't tell me any more about it other than that, which is very Bob. He, he loves practical jokes and he loves all of that um, sick humor. So I went over there and... Uh, Unbeknownst to me, they they were going to film the uh, the takeoff on Saturday Night Fever's um, floor and the dancing and all that. And I I watched it standing behind something for fear that I would burst out laughing and ruin the take. Uh, but but I didn't. I was brave and kept it all in and hoped I wouldn't implode. <laughs> when did you first realize what they were doing? I mean, was it? Yeah, I heard the the soundtrack. Started. So somebody said, so, so somebody said, somebody said playback or sort of just. Well, Bob told me a little bit. He said, well, some of the, the set may look familiar and, and you may kind of recognize some of the things. And uh, he had on this white um, military jacket over what was the takeoff on John's white suit. And they had it rigged. So, of course, it went right off when he threw it. And uh, that was. That was what uh, I kn- I knew he was going to have that, but I didn't know exactly how it was going to lead into a scene. So he said, "Yeah, they're going to fly the jacket off of me at one point or take it off." And uh, and so I suddenly heard the the track. Um. And and s- Bob started to to dance, and I just fell apart. All right. I mean, it was hysterical. Um. I think I think once you hear that that uh, oh you can tell by the way that, that little thing you know you immediately puts you there. So hearing that I thought oh god what am I in store for? Great. And so how did you how did you react and how did the, the how did the crew react? I mean it must have been knowing that you who had been in the original scene was there. Well he told uh, the Zucker bo- brothers that who are truly the funniest. I mean the, those those guys are just you know of another planet. Um, he had told them I was coming by, so they knew. And then they were kind of playing along. You know, I was not in the soundstage quite yet, and it was closed and not quite ready. And somehow it all got orchestrated that when I came in, it was pretty close to shooting. So they should have run a camera on the reaction because I, I really do think that I, I I just never had to hold a laugh in like that because it was just such a surprise. No, that's hilarious. Yeah. So how did they react to your reaction? Oh, they loved it. Everybody, you know. Oh. <laughs> so you may be the only person who witnessed both of those things live. Can you imagine? And I remember Bob saying that he wanted to uh, invite John to a screening. I said, well, only if I could sit between you, you know, and, and, and see him react to you, reacting to the film, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
I don't think we were able to to schedule that, but uh, I remember it laughing about it a lot. Oh, that's hilarious. Yes. What a great story. Yeah. I love that one. I love that one. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Anything, excuse me, anything about Angie in terms of guest stars or people that just... Oh, my gosh. That was Danny DeVito guest starred on Angie as uh, Uncle Cheech, who was um, a practical joker. And again, Danny's one of those people that before he even starts the line, you're already, you're already invested in it. You're already laughing because he's got such a persona and he created such a funny character um, that it was one of the, the episodes I think we had the most outtakes on. Because the minute he would start, he'd say, well, and we'd all fall down. And, and uh, I think it took probably uh, several hours after the audience left that night to finish that show because of the left. He's, he was great. Um, hilarious. Peter Scolari played uh, a thief who Angie went to school with. He came to rob the house and, and turned out to be an old friend of hers. Um, Tim Thomerson, there really some wonderful, oh, John Randolph, who played uh, Bob's father. Um, most at the time, it was just, it was like a party going to work every day because everybody was just so great. Right. And and funny and into it. Had about the bust of the Jerry Marshall shows, which is unbelievable, unbelievable. If he if he could set the standard, you know, then he was great. All television would be fun. How about um, out of this world? How did that end? That was the only time um, that someone actually said, "Would you like to do this? If you'd like to, here's the start date." And I thought, well, that's. Pretty nice. Um, and I read it, uh, the pilot, and I thought, this is very much like Bewitched or one of those fun kind of... But I never thought it would go, oddly enough, and everyone sees that's going to be real happy to hear that. I didn't. I thought, you know, it's so cute and it's so sweet and it's well-written, but there was not a whole lot of that on the air at the time. So I thought, well, you know, we'll just see where it goes. When did it... When did it the hell was it? Five years. Really? Yeah. So four or five years. It was never a syndication. Was on NBC and then it went over to an, uh, like a syndicated. It was the first time they tried to do. I think it was the first WB show. I think or or or, or Fox or Wood Fox or it was Universal and I think uh, Paramount. UPS. No, I think it was uh, KTL. It was the when they had the Frog. Oh, okay. It was WB. the WB. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I liked that show. It was a fun show. It was a cute show. It that, was. That was the thing that nobody knows about that show. Oh well, people think I was married to a candy dish. Um, that that sort of explain if you could explain the premise because it's been a while yes. since the show's yes. been on, and there are a lot of shows where sometimes you know it's like Charlie's Angels. There's a show where there's a character that you never see. Right. So if you could sort of relate it in that tradition, sure, that'd be great. Um. The show was basically about uh, a young woman, myself, who married an alien. Very, very common. Someone comes in from outer space. and What, to get his green card? That was it. You know, so I thought, well, should I stay on Earth and get married or should I, you know, go back and play around on my planet? So they get married and have a child, but he still goes off to his planet. Um, and the show was about this daughter who didn't know that her father was an alien and she was going to develop all of these powers. And it was very sweet and very cute. And they gradually built in her powers that started supposedly on her 13th birthday. So, um, and the father would talk to us through a, what was supposed to be like a crystal kind of dish that opened. Um, and that was their telephone and, and uh, was actually uh, a pretty well-kept secret. Uh, the dad's voice. Um, was actually a Burt Reynolds, who many people don't know it was Burt. Uh, and he never wanted any um, credit on the show. I think it was kind of his, might have been his Charlie's Angels, you know, his little. But I always thought his voice was so recognizable that people knew anyway. But I was um, amazed that many people didn't. He's got that laugh that is is so burnt uh, that, I, you know, I thought, well, people are going to realize that's him in a minute. So did he do it at the place? Did he phone it in? Did he do it? I don't know. I, I rarely saw him. Um, he did it from wherever he was. I think they sent him, sometimes he was in Florida. This was before he 
started doing television. So, um, or maybe it was during that time and, and he did some of it here, but usually uh, he was not around. But yeah. post. Yeah, which I was disappointed about because I thought, hey, I'll, I'll work with Burt Reynolds on in a scene, you know, no problem. Reunion show. I mean, it plays a well name. There you no, go. I fell in love with the nail. There you go. That's why people didn't realize it was Burt. Right? Oh, but, yeah. Uh, any other stories about that show? Um, it was a fun show. Well, I liked it. It was really show. sweet. I remember um, my last, for the fourth season, I was pregnant. Uh, I mean, in reality, was, my, my, we were expecting our son, and uh, we, my husband and I were expecting our first child. And I couldn't be pregnant on the show because my husband was on another planet. They kept trying to hide me. And I was getting larger and larger and larger. And so finally, in one episode, uh, they had my head actually just detached from my body and green screened it because there was just no way of, you know, hiding me any longer. I was at the end of my eighth month. And uh, in one episode, my head floated around, I think, uh, for which I thought was one of my better performances. That may be one of the best pregnancy hiding stories I've ever heard. I was so huge. That at one point, one of the writers said, which is one of my favorite lines, he said, if, if we do one more show before you give birth, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to give you something very large to hold. And you'll say, honey, when the exterminators get here, have them throw this over the house. So <laughs> I was big. <laughs> your son wears, why would The nine pounds. Was, yeah. Was nice chunk of chin. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah. You think I screamed on the bridge? <laughs> yeah. Have we missed anything? Any stories that you've been dining out on all these years that you've you know, been trying to share with I, I'm sure that I'll, I'll get home and I'll remember more than I, than I can think of. Um, oh, but you gave us such great stuff. I can tell you one story that is actually... It's got to do with Steve McQueen and the Zucker brothers. And I can't remember. I know Bob was there. I can't remember who else was there. Um, oh, I, I think, I think uh, uh, Abrams was there as well. We were all having lunch at the commissary. And it was um, during the time they were shooting airplane and we were still doing Angie. And Steve McQueen was shooting Bullet which was the last film I think he did. And, you know, there are some people, even if you're in the business, at least for me, they're just legends. And it, it, it does, it's not about credentials or being in the club. I just can't speak to them. And I remember seeing him. Um, we were having lunch, all of us, and I remember seeing him on this tier sort of facing us. Uh, he was at, on a table by, by himself having lunch. And I said, oh, sorry. And uh, right. the, Jerry said, well, why don't you go and say hello? I said, I can't say hello. I said, well, great. I said, of course you can. He said, I, no. He said, well, then we'll help you. And they started to inch the table closer and closer. And suddenly like six people, eight people, however many we were, were inching the table. And poor Steve McQueen is sitting there watching this table of people come to her, and I'm dying. Thinking, and I'm, I keep moving my chair with the table. And we get literally right up against him, and he, you know, he's a little above us, and he looks at us, and, and uh, Jerry said, um, she wants to say something to you. I said, hello. Then he said, uh -huh. and they all inched the table back to where we were sitting initially. And I, I just, and he was, Absolutely hysterical because he, he was totally deadpan through the whole day. He just sort of fell off and continued eating his soup. Well, Lucille Ball would have been so proud. It was one of the most exciting moments of my life. <laughs> and this is the first time I've ever told that story. Really? Yeah. Well, who'd believe it? But I have witnesses. I believe everything. Completely gullible. I just, you, know, you could have told me that, that they really cast an alien to play. Well, they did. They did, mm. but that's another show. <laughs>